How common was the practice of leaving kids unattended in that complex like that with a door ajar and etc.? Well, I don't know how common it was, but but for them, they felt comfortable with doing that. They felt that it was safe. They decided that they weren't going to take advantage of the babysitting offering service. Um, what is interesting with in regards to Jerry and Kate is that they took three children, you know, under five, and they did have no buggy. They took no buggy with them uh, in terms of that. So they were initially told that they were due to eat their food, both in terms of uh, dinners and uh, breakfast at the main hotel complex but they uh, said that they would prefer to eat at the tabas bar and reluctantly the hotel complex said okay we'll open it for you because there's a large number of you we'll open it for you and allow you to to go there they had the facilities if they wanted to and of course they could also have potentially used each other within the group that they were with that one night perhaps one family drops out and they sit with all the kids but you know and, and not or not all not everybody went there were some uh, of that group who who did spend time and stayed at home and watched their children but they took the decision that they were going to leave their three children in the apartment block on their own whilst they went to the tapas bar did they ever state why they didn't uh take up the babysitting facility that was available I don't, don't believe there was any real clarity in terms of why they did or didn't. I, th I think they felt that it wasn't an appropriate service to do. I think there were some questions about whether or not there was a fa that, that facility properly existed that night uh, to be able to provide it. Um, and ultimately, they, they didn't use it. There was one really interesting uh, point, which is we know that in the days leading up to Madeline's disappearance, that Sean and Amelise were heard to cry because uh, a neighbour, upstairs neighbour, heard that. What we also know, and in an age-appropriate way, is that on the morning of the disappearance, Madeline said to Jerry and Kate that she was woken last night by Sean and Amelie's. Where were they? Because she'd obviously gone to check to see where mum and dad was, and they weren't there. Uh, in which case, Jerry and Kate, again, age-appropriately, said to Madeline, well, we were only in the tapas bar across the way. And I think that is a really, really significant point, and, and I'm sure you'll want me to explain later why. But that is really, really significant. On the morning of Madeline's disappearance, she said to her parents, where were you last night when Sean and Amelie's woke me up? Perhaps you could expand on that now, then. Well, why that's really significant is that that means that that uh, Madeline is fully aware of where Jerry and Kate are. And in order for her to go and talk to mum and dad, she would have to have left the apartment block via the back door, gone on to the public road path and then back in again some 50 yards down the road. So what that means is that in order for her to go and speak to mum and dad, she is out of the complex. She is in the public domain and therefore if anybody had wanted to snatch her to abduct her, the access was there. And there is only two elements that are crucial that exist within regards to the abduction of children. There are three elements, but the two are the most important. That is access, opportunity and motivation. Now, motivation uh, is different to everybody. If it's in relation to the abduction of a child, uh, it may well be sexual. It may well be uh, power, control, you know, all of those issues. But actually, motivation from an investigator's point of view doesn't help you when you're starting to investigate. Yes, down the road, you know, once you've caught your offender, it can be very interesting to find out where the motivation sits. But at the initial period of any investigation, it's about access and opportunity. What is the access in order to uh, uh, commit your crime? And what is the opportunity? OK, so let's look at both of those. In order for her to be abducted, she goes out of the apartment block and onto a public road. Uh, offenders, uh, where the child is unknown to them, it is almost unheard of that they will go into an apartment block and abduct, abduct a child. It is almost unheard of. It is. It certainly never happened in the UK, and it's very rare to have happened around the world. So you could you could almost with certainty rule out that the offender entered the apartment to abduct her. But she's now on the public road. And what we do know from experience in relation to child abductions is that they are predatory and they, were and they are opportunistic. And by that, I mean they're not uh, planned in terms of who the victim is. Yes, they plan to abduct a child, but not a specific child. And when we look at two of the most high profile cases, and that is Jeanette Tate in 1978 in the West Country and um, 
Sarah Payne in relation to uh, in Surrey in Roy Whiting. So what happens is Roy Whiting, a known abductor, he'd abducted a child previously, uh, had a custodial sentence but was released. That morning, he set out to abduct a child, not Sarah Payne. He had no idea who he was going to abduct. He drives down to uh, the south uh, of England and whilst he is there, he is beside a field and he sees Sarah Payne. Now, Sarah Payne happened to be walking with her parents and her brother. Sarah walks some distance away from her parents and brother through a hole in the fence, and Roy Whiting abducts her. Now, the point to which her brother uh, appears through this hole in the fence that, that Sarah just walked through, he sees the back of a white van disappear. Nothing else sees the back of a white van. That white van belonged to Roy Whiting. And in fact, it was such a significant sighting that it enabled the police very quickly to get on to Roy Whiting as being a suspect. And I know that because uh, very shortly after uh, her Sarah Payne's disappearance, uh, when I got back to work, I was initially on leave. And uh, when I went back to work, which was probably about four days, three or four days later, uh, I join the task force to look for the British, uh, so the Surrey element of the potential offenders. We looked at two key targets uh, and one of those key targets we were told about was Roy Whiting. And the police had him under their sight right from the very early days. We looked at another possible suspect. Um, so they had him and Roy Whiting didn't set out to abduct Sarah Payne. She just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And then look at Jeanette Tate. Jeanette Tate is out delivering newspapers with some friends. She cycles down a hill. And when she gets to the bottom of the hill, she is abducted. A short distance behind her are our friends. And by the time they get over the top of the hill and get to the bottom of it, she's gone. Her bike is on the ground and she has vanished. Her body has never been found. But Robert Black is certainly, I believe, he's now dead, is what was the person that abducted her and subsequently killed her. It fits his MO to an absolute T. He was never brought to justice. But the point being is that she was just a matter of seconds away from her friends. And significantly, she was never targeted that day. That wasn't a, a time that you could be sure that she'd be in that route in any way at all. So they're opportunistic. And I believe that's exactly what happened with Madeline. Now, I've written about it. I've given it's given it's had worldwide coverage, my opinion in relation to this. Not everyone agrees. There'll be some that go that makes a lot of sense. But there'll be a lot of people, of course, who are absolutely divided in that. They say no, that's not possible in any way at all. The reality, of course, is nobody other than the offender or whoever the offender or offenders have spoken to knows what happened to Madeleine. Uh, and the reality is, of course, I don't know more than anybody else other than I've done a very extensive review. I've been to the location. I've looked at and read all the evidence. I've spoken to all the key people involved in that. So in, in terms of being informed, I'm probably one of the most informed people in regards to what I believe happened to Madeleine McCann.